Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Kendra Sakamoto. I'm a librarian here at West Vancouver Memorial Library. I am delighted to present this evening's event, Bobby Burgers, in conversation with Hilary Letwin in partnership with the West Vancouver Art Museum. Uh, before we get started, I have a few Zoom items to share. Tonight, we will be using the closed caption feature for the hearing impaired. This program is automatically transcribed by Zoom, so please understand it may not be a perfectly accurate transcription. To enable or disable the captions, select the live transcript option on your menu. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the program. You may use the chat feature to submit any questions that you may have. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that for those of us on the North Shore, we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. If you are uncertain as to which ancestral territory you live on, I encourage you to visit whose.land to learn more about the traditional lands on which you reside. Here on the West Coast, we are surrounded by the artistic beauty of an amazing natural landscape. I am incredibly grateful to live on these beautiful lands that the Coast Salish peoples have been the careful caretakers of since time immemorial. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Hilary Letwin. Hilary gained her PhD in art history from Johns Hopkins University. She has held curatorial fellowships at the British Museum and the Baltimore Museum of Art. She currently works as the museum administrator and curator at the West Vancouver Art Museum. Welcome, Hilary. Thank you for joining us. So welcome, everybody. I'd like to first start out by thanking the West Vancouver Memorial Library for co-presenting tonight's talk between Bobby and myself. Uh, Bobby Burgers is a West Vancouver-based painter whose work intimately examines the natural processes of decay, transformation, and metamorphosis. While floors, florals have always been her primary source of inspiration, her unique understanding of their physical composition and metaphorical connotations have allowed her to push the classical subject to near abstraction. In addition to canvas, Berger's expressive mark making and textural surfaces extend to collage and sculpture. Berger's has exhibited her work internationally, including in Sweden and China, and she's represented in Toronto, Vancouver, and San Francisco. It's been such a pleasure working with you, Bobby, uh, for the last uh, year and a half, preparing for this exhibition. Uh, we first started to work on this project about 18 months ago. And of course, we could have taken a number of different paths in terms of what we wanted to include in this exhibition. In the end, of course, we've settled on your new work, Bobby, made primarily during COVID lockdowns and thereafter. Uh, this exhibition, The Hard Work of Spring, that we're going to be looking at and talking about this evening, represents a really important departure in your work. And it's something that I hope we can discuss. This departure is something I hope we can discuss in more detail this evening. So welcome, Bobby. Uh, I'd really like to start our conversation this evening with a discussion about West Vancouver. Uh, it's where we are this evening. Uh, you grew up here and you're an active member in our community. Can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing here and how you feel it has impacted your art and your career as an artist? Um, well, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, my parents immigrated from Holland when um, they were first married and I was born here in North Vancouver. And I've lived in West Vancouver for ever since then, since I was born. So I, yes, and I've, I've, I've known the, um, the community quite extensively because my father was an architect. And so we've lived in all sorts of different spots all the way along the coast. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful community. And I, I, I love the, um, the nature and space and um, I'm very grateful to live so close to the ocean and have that be a large part of my, my life. For, um, for many years, I sort of attributed my work to um, primarily florals being the inspiration, as you were saying, but uh, I'm starting to realize it just at this part of my life, how important the ocean is to my work as well. 
and um, having spent the weekend helping my kids with their sailing regatta, I really, and there was that bomb, bomb cyclone that was going through. Um, I, I realized how, how much I love the ocean and how much I love wind and the, um, that building sense of excitement and uh, the, the thrill. And I feel like it just really imbues our bodies with energy, like sort of sinks into our skin. And so I'm, I'm starting to see my work being very tied to the ocean and to the, it's always felt like it was part of the cycles of, of seasons, but I think that's, that's sort of being um, equaled out by my sense of, of love for the water and, and for um, storms and calm seas and, and everything else. So it's, it's can be viewed, seen a little bit in these pieces. I think there's a sense of tumbling and, um, of sort of whirlwind. So yeah, anyways, West Van is a huge part of my life and, um, and my kids have all grown up here. And I, it's, a, it's a beautiful community and I feel blessed. And, and certainly, um, at least in terms of the last 18 months, nature has, has offered incredible respite, I think for everybody. We've all appreciated a little bit more how great it is for us to be able to get outside in whatever capacity. And, uh, and enjoy that. So um, let's talk about the work that we have in this exhibition. So the hard work of spring, we have uh, 25 of your works in total. And uh, for those of you who have not yet had a chance to see the exhibition, it's a selection of different um, mixed media and works on paper. Uh, so we've got some three-dimensional sculpture, we've got some uh, wall sculpture, uh, one wall sculpture piece, we have some works on paper. Uh, and um, uh, Bobby, I, I think you're going to walk around a little bit over the course of our talk tonight, so you'll be able to show yeah. some other pieces in more detail. But um, it, these pieces uh, in our exhibition really represent a snapshot of the last year and a half for you. Um, and, and as I said at, at the beginning, to me, this work really represents a departure from your previous work. Uh, do you see this as well, or is that just me with my curatorial lens on? Um, I was dabbling in collage work, um, for about two years prior to this collection, but this is the first time I've, I've shown them so extensively and such a complete set. Um, before I think that I was treating my drawings as, um, way of exploring before I started painting and, and sort of moving around ideas and, and having that flexibility to uh, basically pick up a paint uh, brush stroke, which would normally be on a canvas and permanent, but with my collages and drawings, especially with collages, it's like being able to try out different scenarios and, um, and before I would move on to works on canvas. And so this, this is the first time I've kind of really thought of them as entities onto their own and and given them the sort of the weight and the importance of a, an entire room. Yeah, yeah, it's um, drawing, yes, I was saying, became a bigger, bigger part of my life when I had a bit more room in my studio to lay things out because most of my drawings are done with oils and uh, they take anywhere from a week to longer. Some of them I've noticed are quite old and are still not dry because it gets quite thick in areas. So I, um, I really started having that space and the room to experiment when I moved to a bigger studio. And then it started, the more room I had, the more experimenting I could do. And um, so yes, drawing has always been, it wasn't, it wasn't a major part of my practice, but over, over the last five years, I think it's kind of eaten up about half. So, and, and the works that we have here, uh, the two series. So we have two complete series that we're showing. Uh, it's a jungle out there and hibernation. Hibernation actually predating it's a jungle out there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the circumstances in which you created those works because you, um, at the very beginning of our first and second COVID lockdowns, you ended up sort of working primarily from home at that period. 
right? So is, yeah, how, how instrumental is COVID, I guess, is what I'm asking in the production of these particular pieces? Well, I mean, I think some of the names um, allude to, well, hibernation being that, yes, those first, that first series I did create at home. Um, so it did feel like we were hibernating and over the winter and the spring and, um, and you know, it's a direct uh, link to that feeling, that sensation. And then the opposite with the, it's a jungle out there. Um, it did feel like stepping outside that you never knew what we like. It was just, there was so many unknowns at the beginning and still are, and that it felt very threatening and like, you didn't know where the attack was going to come from. So, um, plus they're extremely turbulent pieces when you see them up close, there's a lot of um, different elements butting up against each other. I, I worked from home, not necessarily because I couldn't go to my studio because my studio was, uh, you know, it's a solitary space. Nobody else comes in there, but at the same time, my kids were home from school and I didn't feel like I could leave them for the day or even a few hours at the beginning and, and to fend for themselves. So really, I guess it was sort of like a hunkering down as a family and, and just staying close. And this scale worked relatively well at home, but it did take over, especially with the collages, because it takes um, usually how my process works is I create um, a series of of um, different elements and so maybe about 30 uh, drawings some are more painterly some are more like sketches and I combine them so you can imagine that that takes up quite a bit of space when they're laying around your house and everyone's at home. But but it's interesting to note that a lot of the, the two-dimensional a lot of the collages and works on paper that we have in this exhibition are smaller in scale than what you would typically produce in your studio generally. Oh yeah, very much so. Um, the the it's a jungle out there series, like the pieces behind me here. You can see uh, there are probably about 30, um, 30 by 22 or 24 inches. And but still, when you have 30 of them around, it still takes up a lot of space in a in a small house. So but it was, um, yeah, it, it, it felt very comfortable to work on that scale and, uh, and to do something a bit more intimate in my more confined circumstances. So let's talk a little bit about the materials. You, you've sort of alluded to them. And in fact, the work that you were sitting in front of, uh, it includes woodblock printing. Uh, as one of the as one of the the media that is represented in the work, can you talk a little bit about the materials in this exhibition? Yeah. So the interesting thing for me about having made drawing such an integral part of of my process is that I'm finding it really um, exciting to sort of bend the mind's eye a little bit in what material is actually being used because. Part of the game is that that almost anything can mimic anything else, um, it, or at least I find that it, I can try to do that. So that there's sort of a seamlessness between different mediums, and then they so they can bend in and resemble each other, and then bend out again. And um, I first started working on woodblock prints, like this piece um, behind me here. I'm going to pull it a little bit closer uh, with. Peter from New Leaf Editions, and that was, ooh, I would say five or six years ago in the woodblock um, genre. And having worked with him on that, I, I could never get the idea of just it being a one, you know, a re repetitive process. So whenever uh, I would create one, I would love to individualize them and, and sort of see where I could take them elsewhere. So they all ended up morphing into having oil a bar and acrylic on involved and, and drawing elements and pencil. So they became, you know, unique pieces in the end. So anyways, I'm getting off track, but what I wanted to say is that with the woodblock prints, it, for me, they start with a paintbrush line, a paint, a paint stroke, a brush stroke. <laughs> and, and then 
the way Peter and, and his assistants carve it is that they become these incredibly delicate and intricate lines that end up looking like drawing to me. And so it's this double, um, double feature, I guess. It's, it is a brushstroke, but it kind of looks like a drawing that's done of a brushstroke. And, and it's those sort of, um, you know, uh, that make your, make your eye look a little bit deeper and question what's going on and, and sort of jolts you out of, of it, what it's representing, but more maybe about the materials and, um, you know, and then there's areas like in here, the, where the pastel is the exact same shade as the woodblock was sort of this dirty gray. And so they're sort of mimicking each other. And I've just found that it goes around in a circle for me with, with painting. It's whatever I do on, on paper, it's, it's so um, unforgiving paper. It's, it's like such virgin territory. And once you've got the white of the paper um, marked, it, you can never really take it back. So that play that I have with paper kind of extended over to my works on canvas because I wanted to have that same, that complete rawness and that, that, that truly untouched territory on the canvas. And so I started painting after drawing so much, I started trying to create that on, on the canvas by my painting on raw canvas, which is the same thing. It can't be reversed from, you can't erase it. You can't take it back. So it makes everything extremely considered um, while forcing myself to be free. So it's a very strange uh, experience to, to force myself to be very instinctual, uh, but know that, that whatever I do, there's no coming back from. So it's, it's, yeah, it's fun. I can and show you a little bit about that more over on the, um, the canvas piece in the other room. Sorry, what were you going to say, Hillary? I was just going to say, have you worked on raw canvas a lot previously, or is this fairly new for you? It's about two years old, um, like to have done it so consistently. Um, my first exhibit of more works on raw canvas were um, at Equinox Gallery in about a year and a half ago. And, um, and it's something that you can't really see it probably even in, in a, a phone call or a Zoom call, or I definitely don't notice it in photography, but I think it, it's created this whole other side to painting, which is not the movement of the brushstroke or the movement of the drawing lines or the colors, but it's sort of a matteness and a sheen that completely exciting interplay. So it depends on where you're standing. There's, there's this ultra matte, almost light absorbing areas. And then there's um, pieces like this that have a bit more texture to them, which, which shine and pop out. So it's, it's made them in a way more three-dimensional, even though there isn't as much paint as my older work. So that's the perfect segue to talk a little bit about the three-dimensional work in the exhibition. Do you mind going back into gallery one and showing yeah. us the, what, maybe we'll look at toxic sentimentality, the sculpture in the center of the room. Yeah. Is that a nice view? I don't know. There. So talk us through your sculpture that you started producing. Well, as I was working on the paperwork and I had done the, the series of drawings like hibernation, which are true drawings, um, moving over to the collage, which uh, has a little bit of three dimensionality to it from the layering up and also the, 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 the just raw pigment that's sitting on top from the oil bars. And then we have the next like, I guess, texture added in with the woodblock print, which has a 3D effect, you know, when it presses in. So that's sort of, and everything is becoming a, like slightly more, um, you know, losing a sense of space awareness. And, and then having created some wall sculptures where it really starts to burst out, where I'm using all sorts of materials like um, wood, ceramic, 
canvas, uh, a lot of paper, paint, plaster, and kind of building up so that it's it's really like a painting um, that's just become massively three dimensional. And I thought, well, it, I've never tried a freestanding sculpture before in in this format. I had done some bronzes in the past, but I. I know it's delicate and it doesn't probably make that much sense, um, but I, I just, the whole exhibit was how far I could push a drawing and, and to what extent can I play with that form? And so I wanted them to be delicate and I want them to have lots of areas that resemble drawings so that have um, that very raw, honest material. Uh, and, and I didn't want to, cover it up and pretend it was something else. I, so I really like the, the drawing aspects butting up with, with some of the other materials. But I think sculpture is sort of like that last frontier where it's probably, um, it has to be so, you know, it's, you have to look at it from all sides. It has to make sense from all sides. It has to be dynamic and different and and so it, it just really makes me think about the way light reflects on it. That's a new element for me. It's different than a drawing because there's shadows created. So, you know, everything gets, um, there's just, just, it's like moving from photography to video or something. There's just so many, it's like sound is added to it. Now there's shadows. Um, I mean, if you could get scent in there somehow, it would be quite fun. But <laughs> it's, I, yeah, I, I just, I thought I would see how far I could push that form and, and maybe with the shadows, it'll go back and affect my paintings and it's, you know, new ways to play. I think it's nice. It's like a, it's like um, a little monster sitting in the corner. <laughs> this what this one's here is, 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 I guess a little bit less about the paper aspects and it's more about, um, the larger plaster areas and ceramic areas. And I think that the, like we were saying at the beginning, there's sometimes I, I like to think of my things not as petals or but maybe more like as waves or, or just sheer momentum. And um, with working in these, with plaster and sculpting it over my, my under forms, and carving it off and moving it around and then drawing them. I just, I feel like there's just a world of possibilities um, and that these, these can resemble a petal falling or a, something to do with nature, but it also can just be the feeling of wind. And I, I find that quite um, exciting. And um, just for the sake of clarity, Bobby, the, the white sort of foam bits, that's actually plaster that you're working with there. Yes, yes. So these these are plastered and painted. So they're um, yeah, they, they have a certain amount of weight in the end. But I think it it I I try and keep I want it to still mimic the paperwork with the line drawings and and have it flow over. And I think it's really interesting when you have like for when I'm playing, it's like there's just natural connections that are made. Um, that when lines perfectly fit up and it feels like they was just meant, it was, it, it's like a continuation of thought. Um, and it happens sometimes in the drawings and, and, and then the collages were two elements that are really um, from opposite worlds can perfectly align and be, and feed off each other and, and sort of talk as one, even though they're, you know, foreign entities. So let's talk a little bit about your titles, Bobby, because they're so poetic, they're so evocative, and I think they are an important part of each piece. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you, uh, how you identify titles for works and, and what your inspiration is for those? Well, yes, and I think you saw a little bit when you first came to the studio. My, I've always thought of painting as, is like, it's a very subliminal process for me. I'm not necessarily fully um, conscious of each mark that I make. I don't think any mind could 
concentrate that long on on what's only visually in front. It's just, I think, natural for your mind to wander to different areas, especially when you're creating. And so I listen to whatever, whatever influences out there in the world and the radio or podcasts or music. And quite often something, it's kind of like with drawing, like it something out in the universe will just um, catch my attention and, um, and seem to be almost like a cosmic fit to whatever I'm, I'm working on at the time. And so I keep a long list and jotted down notes of, and it's interesting when I flip back through it, it's basically like my painting catalog of, of what I'm working on. But in between, there's all these little notes with, with names and titles or thoughts or maybe philosophies that have been being talked about or something in the news. And, um, and they somehow seem to, maybe it's just because what my mind is drawn to at the time, but there seems to be sort of waves that go through it. So there might be um, two or three months in this book of five or six pages where it seems to all be going into sort of like maybe a self pity mode and, and everything's <laughs> connecting to that or, and then it comes out onto a very, you know, a wave of sunniness and an optimism, or maybe it can turn more spiritual, but they do seem to read in sort of general um, arenas of, of thoughts that maybe when I stand back, I can see that over a year's time where there's chunks. And so I, I pull from that when I go to name the pieces um, either during or after they're created and and from that, there seems to be an overall theme that sort of appears for the entire exhibit. And it, it's, it's not like I've sat down with a preconceived notion of what I want to be um, saying, but it just sort of emerges as do the paintings. It's very similar to, um, um, oops, there they are. <laughs> it's very similar to painting in a way. Like I, I, I don't know what's going to come out of it. I don't know the way things are going to move. And it's only when I stand it back that I kind of see an overall thread um, that's, that's running through everything. But yeah, that's what happens with the, the um, titles. And uh, I, this one here is Spoiled Perfect. I think you mentioned that. And I, I guess at the time, I just thought it's like one of my major themes is decay and, and, and sort of the, the changes our own bodies go through and, and, and um, the natural cycles and fruit and, and, you know, the rot that we see around us at this time of year in the fall and everything sinking back in. And um, that's the part that I'm always drawn to the most is not always the fresh and new it's well, I, a little bit in the spring when there's blossoms, but I'm more interested in that sort of um, that, beautiful dance as things fall and so I think um something like spoiled perfect is just feels like it's at the perfect stage of its life even though others might think it's spoiled or if it's gone bad or yeah. if it's past its time <laughs> so poetic so in a minute uh we're going to allow for people to write questions in the chat function. So I would ask uh, our audience to start to think about some questions that they would like to ask Bobby uh, about the exhibition. But before we do that, um, Bobby, I would love to hear a little bit about where you're going now and what the, what the work you're producing now represents and, uh, and, and what, what are you working on for future projects in the next little while? Do you have a sense of that yet? Do we get to hear about what you're, what you're busy with right now? Well, I'm just starting, um, but I think that there's also like a sort of a natural tendency for me at this time of year to sink back into deeper and moodier feelings, darker, um, a bit more melancholic. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping to create some works that I think are going to end up being, or hopefully they will move towards uh, a newer simplicity and that, um, that they would kind of start to speak more about um, that water 
thread that I had been talking in the ocean thread uh, and how like, I feel like there's, there's this like, you know, I've talked about it before about it being like a game where the, the paint does something and, and then I react so that it's like this kind of chess game kind of feeling where um, like every paint that I use has a slightly different, I guess, density and, and pigment to it. And, and there's like so many infinite possibilities that it's impossible for me to predict what they're gonna do when I put them together. I mean, there's everything from how wet my canvas is and how wet my brush is to how thick or thin the paint is, the, the angle of my canvas. Like there's so many different um, possibilities that I want them to just kind of lead the way in, in this a bit more where I'm, I'm pushing that, that, you know, giving them their independence even a bit more than I have with the raw canvases in the back past. So I'm, yeah, that's what I'm gonna be working towards. I'm going to see um, how I can create works that um, sort of are emblems of simplicity and, but also will keep the viewer very entertained. And that's something that's very important for me. Um, I, I tend to, I guess, create very, busy and, and chaotic work because I always think of these new areas that you can fall into and places to hide and, and different textures. And, and I want whoever is viewing it to see, to be a reflection of themselves and not be too literal. So I, they, they sometimes become very, uh, you know, almost like, yeah, I guess just chaotic. And so I'm, that's my goal is to see if I can have a little bit more restraint with the new work and, and, but still make it um, playful and, uh, and hopefully entertaining for the viewer for to be able to see it in, in many, many different ways. Do you anticipate working on the same smaller scale as, as, uh, as it, it, as it's a jungle out there, for example, the work that's right behind you, do you, do you keep, Will you keep working on paper at that scale? I absolutely am. I was doing that all day today and also in my kitchen because it just feels more comfortable now. I don't know why. <laughs> I, um, I, it's a new trend and my kids just were saying, why are you doing this at home, mom? You can go to the studio. But I maybe there's almost like a craftsmanship or something that feels very homey with all the, the intricate cutting and... Um, like I've, I did all the, the, the movements over the studio, but now that now it's the, the, the infinite exacto cutting and, and meshing together of works that feels almost like, um, I don't know, maybe it just feels more, a little bit more domesticated than being in the big industrial studio space. So I am doing that. I am doing it at home and I am trying to um, turn them in a different direction where there is a sort of a serenity that these pieces um, perhaps don't in view. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think this is a great opportunity for us to uh, address some of the questions that have come up in the chat function. And I would just encourage you, um, if you have a question, to go ahead and type that in the chat and we will uh, try and include as many as we can. Uh, so um, we, we have one question. Uh, what inspires you, Bobby? Uh, so I, I think maybe can you expand a little bit more on on what's inspiring you at this minute what it what, what's at the at the forefront of your mind for inspiration well I mean there's uh using materials that are new is exciting for me I I like the experimentation of that so the, the just the pure material aspect of things the experimentation that's that can be um very inspiring having new new pastels or trying out a different plaster or collaborating on printmaking and then using them in a new way like just using um diverse and sort of maybe untraditional 
materials in my work it gets me excited because I like to think that I'm for myself um, going down new paths and innovating and and seeing what's possible from a subject matter point of view I think that what inspires me is as I said like very much weather um, change of seasons and uh, I guess my own my own sentiments at the time you know if it's if I'm feeling um, somehow more joyous, I, I like to figure out a way to express that. And so, and then, you know, the, the changes these seasons are always probably um, the biggest indicator in my work of what, and, and they're always changing. So I always have new inspiration and now it's dark and rainy and cold, and I'm going to figure out a way to find beauty in that and to, to um, find, as I said, serenity and, um, and to enjoy it for what it is and not, you know, push it. Um, just like, like when I was painting more literal flowers, the thing that interests me about um, flowers originally was the, the use of color and the, for my, you know, it was like one of the only subject matters I can think of that so um, extensively can explore color. And then really now I'm almost, I would consider myself comparatively monochromatic to my old days. And um, what really inspires me about florals is that the, the opening up of personalities and the crumpling down, um, the delicacy, the tissue thin, um, um, uh, petals and and just and just kind of, I guess it's just something that we can really observe in nature and and see it as as a beautiful thing and that young and fresh out of the ground is not always the um, the complexity that I'm yearning for. So we have some technical questions that have come through. Uh, we have one uh, audience member who would like to know how you glue together your sculpture, what material you use for gluing that together. Um, I use a few things. Um, I, at some points I will, um, mostly I use acrylic medium, like the clear, acrylic medium it's it's essentially like glue and uh and it's there and it's strong and it's archival so that's what I use um to hold things in place while I'm gluing I will pin um and when pinning does not work I will staple and then remove and I also use giant globs of paint that uh also work as glue but very expensive glue <laughs> Excellent. Uh, another audience member would like to know if the woodblock prints are put through a press. Yes, they are. Yes. So um, down on Gamba Island with Peter at New Leaf, he has, um, I think this is about as large as his press right now will go in, in studio. So they are about, I want to say about four by four and a half feet, these woodblock prints. And, um, and they go through a press, which is what gives them their interesting relief uh, when when you look up close. It's like they're almost carved in to the paper. And another question about materials, uh, would you ever consider doing bronzes again? Yeah, well, I did, as I guess you're noticing, I did um, a series of bronzes probably about six years ago now and I loved it, but um, it's kind of like printmaking. I can't play around and alter them afterwards. And I've, I haven't found the um, discipline to, to um, accept a series at this point that is repetitive. I've, there's something in me that makes me want to have each one slightly different than the last. So although with the roses that I made, they were... A, a set um, series, I think of 10 different roses that could can be combined in different ways. But yeah, bronze, I mean, the reason I went over to um, the plaster and the ceramic, I mean, ceramic first, yes, it's super heavy, 
and kind of awkward to use and um, to adhere to each other. But the scale can be so much more. It's first of all, super immediate. And, um, and I can create such individuality in each piece. And I'm not um, ever stuck with that one shape. Whereas bronze, once you've made the mold and you've, you've gone through that whole process, you really are um, you know, bound to that shape. But I'm not saying, I think it's more of a scale thing for me right now. If I can do an enormous bronze, I would love to go back to bronze. <laughs> Maybe you need to do some public art. <laughs> I think it's time. I think that there should be some very giant brushstroke petal crumbling bronze sculpture oh, somewhere. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Um, uh, Bobby, we've had a few people ask if you ever teach any studio classes or if anybody has the opportunity to um, do any sort of um uh, any, any work with you in that capacity? Do you, do you teach classes? Have you taught classes or do you have any plans to in the future? Um, I have taught my kids and their friends for most of their lives, but I, um, I do not teach classes. No, I, um, it's kind of a funny thing. Like, I guess because I, I taught myself, I just feel like the best way to learn is through constant experimentation. And, and I don't know any other way um, to, to sort of work past uh, hurdles and, um, and maybe because I work that way, I just feel like that's a great way for other people to work too. And, um, you know, every day I feel like I'm learning, which is kind of exhausting, but it's also, really exhilarating because when I do kind of break through on something, I feel like it's, it's very much my own. So, um, and it's also part of like probably why I am sort of fluid in using different materials because I don't actually know how to use them because nobody's ever taught me. So when I use a oil bar or oil paints, or, I mean, I do everything. The only thing I concentrate is making sure that it's archival, but um, besides that, you know, I haven't really taught how to, you know, say blend or mix or, or um, how to use just whatever material in a very specific way. And I think that gives me a sense of freedom. It's like being unskilled is making me feel free. Excellent. Um, we've had a question uh, about uh, sort of a follow up to what you were speaking about in terms of your painting having your paintings having less paint and sort of going into a, a slightly more minimalistic approach. And our audience member would like to know what your path to this and your thinking um, to the stage in your work in terms of having less paint and using less paint. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, I think that what I was trying to say is that I, with works on raw canvas, that, that there's this new element that is, um, it's now like a different sense altogether. So before we were, I was saying, you know, you know, most of my paint would have the same sheen, it would have the same thickness, and it was just all about what it was depicting. And, you know, most people enjoy texture because it looks very visceral and, and um, is, it can be quite exciting to see the depth and the usage of paint. But why I'm drawn to, it's not necessarily less paint, it's just applied differently. It, there's areas where it's sink, sinking into the canvas because it's raw and bleeding out. And that, as I was saying, it's like watching a photo develop, it's moving in its own way and then it gives me something to react to. And so where I do go thick and heavy, it, there's more of an exciting um, interplay between the two. It's not, it's not just an overall theme. It, it, it lets one say it one thing and the other say the other thing. And I think that um, there's, so th th that whole, sh uh, like what I was saying with the sculptures and the shadows being a new element, like that you get to, you know, visually explore um, because they cast shadows and it's something else to think about and what, what they look like. It's like with working on raw canvas and, and letting areas it's there's, some are completely mad and absorbing of light and impossible to capture and look completely different in different times of the day. So at nighttime, I have a, a deep, deep blue one in my 
my hallway and at nighttime with the light on it, it almost looks pink because, um, so it's just much more subtle in, in, in what you can discover. Um, like the pieces I was working on today, the paperworks, I'm using different types of inks and, and then different types of chalk pastels and chalk pastels are very, very, very matte and dusty and um, inks can be almost iridescent. And those aren't something, things you see from far. So it's just feel like it's adding a different language to my work to let um, the different materials speak and also um, for light to catch it in a different way. It's a long, Excellent. long answer, sorry. <laughs> That's a very good answer. <laughs> I think uh, that Bobby, this is probably a good uh, time to wrap up our questions. There are some really fantastic comments in the chat function expressing admiration for you and for your work uh, and some appreciation, lots of appreciation for the complexity of this work that we have in this exhibition. And, so not um, to go simple then? What's that? No more. <laughs> so don't go stains and easy and light. <laughs> I, well, I think um, I think we have a number of audience members who've known your work for quite a long time and are excited to see you uh, enter into this this phase, this new phase. As am I. Thank you. Uh, so I think this is probably a great time to wrap up our conversation. Uh, I would like to finish with. Uh, th a big thank you to Bobby for the opportunity to speak tonight about this exhibition uh, and for working with us to present this exhibition, The Hard Work of Spring. I would also like to uh, say my thanks to the staff at the West Vancouver Memorial Library, uh, Taryn Urquhart and Kendra for helping us to present this evening. Uh, and I would like to thank you, our audience, for joining us. Uh, I would also like to mention that we produced a publication uh, which I will show you. Oh, no, actually, my green screen is eating it, so you can't really see it. <laughs> oh, wow, um, that's super good. That's so cool. What just happened there? It's pretty good. It's pretty like good you only got it. It's like it's appearing <laughs> and disappearing. I love it. My new it's magic. Like it's collaging correct. itself. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that we did produce our, our publication, which is available for purchase for $21. And uh, you can call us on our general number. Uh, you can email us at wvmuseum at westvancouver.ca. Uh, or you can drop by uh, to go ahead and make that purchase if you're interested in acquiring the publication. Uh, so again, huge thanks to everybody and to you, Bobby, for joining us. And I hope that you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. That was fun. Mm -hmm.